tales for dark nights. The following performance is a second round entry in the 2017 Evil Idol voice acting competition. Voting is simple. Following the performance, simply click the thumbs up icon on this video if you'd like them to become a member of the team, or the thumbs down if you'd rather they not. Voting on this entry will conclude one week after the date of its posting. Good luck to all of our contestants. It all started with an itch in the back of her throat. At least, that's what she remembered. She said she'd gone to the doctor and... At a cursory glance, he diagnosed her with strep throat, an infection of Streptococcus aureus, as the diagnosis read on the follow-up appointment request. Mandy was my girlfriend of seven months at this time. We were still fairly new to each other and finding new things to discuss all the time, when most folks would have long ago lost that spark or gotten blissfully bored with the day-to-day -day and ceased to try and make small talk. Our relationship was disgustingly idyllic to any jealous onlookers, and I suppose we were that couple to most people we knew, but we didn't care. Mandy works as the manager for a daycare center on a military base near the town we live in, and she comes home every few months with the sniffles or a cough that she contracted from someone's disease-ridden munchkin, regardless of the policy barring parents from dropping off sick kids, which they invariably do. It's a real pain in the ass. She came over to my place a lot when she didn't feel good, because, as a nurse, I'm a naturally nurturing and caring person. Unless the patient in question is a massive asshole, then I was less than sympathetic to their woes. Mandy, though, she was my favorite patient. Not that I liked her being sick, but I did love spoiling her. I hadn't seen her in a few days when she called me, voice hoarse and scratchy. Hey, I don't feel good. She told me about the diagnosis of strep throat, and I sympathetically took everything she was carrying from her arms when she showed up at my house, ushered her to the bedroom, where there was a bowl of soup waiting, along with the newest episode of The Handmaid's Tale, queued up on Hulu. Your sweet awaits, my lady, I said as I pulled her favorite hoodie, mine, and one of the three pairs of pajama pants that had somehow migrated from her place to mine out of my chest of drawers. I helped her strip down to just her skivvies. She shivered against me, goose pimples standing out on her flesh as she snuggled against me, and helped her dress in the warm, soft outfit. She lay her head against my chest and quietly said, I love you. You take such good care of me. I kissed the top of her head and helped aside the comforter for her to climb into bed, handed her the soup, and hit play on the control. I ran down to the kitchen and grabbed a bottle of beer, grabbed a bowl of soup for myself, and made my way back up to the bedroom, where Mandy had set aside her soup untouched, as far as I could tell. Her bottle of antibiotics stood open next to the half-empty bottle of water, and she had promptly snuggled up and fallen swiftly asleep. I sighed with empathy, set my things down on the bedside table, and stopped the show. I climbed into bed and ate my own soup, drank my beer and watched Criminal Minds as she breathed deeply and steadily in her slumber. I eventually tired enough myself to go to bed. I went to the bathroom, brushed my teeth, among other bedtime rituals, and slid into bed next to her. I could feel heat pouring off her in waves. A sheen of sweat slicked her forehead. I reached out a hand to touch her forehead, but when I touched her, the unexpected happened, to say the least. Her eyes popped open and she growled at me like a feral dog. I drew my hand back but she grabbed my wrist, pulled me toward her and kicked out viciously, sending me flying into the wall on my side of the bed. The impact rattled my molars and I slumped to the floor in a heap. I tried to get up, but something in me told me to lay there, just let this happen. I did, and no sooner had I resigned myself to my fate did the blackness take me. I awoke to pain, 
like I had fallen off a ladder and smashed myself to a thousand little pieces, and someone had put me back together, poorly. I heard myself groan before I opened my eyes. I was treated to a view of the space under my bed. Light poured in through the large windows and illuminated what I'd expect to see under my bed, the occasional showbox and such. I froze as I heard the bed creak. Well, what are you doing on the floor? I turned my head to see her peering down at me with a quizzical expression on her face. Then she saw I was hurt. Oh my god, what happened, baby? She hopped down from the bed to tend to me. She helped me to my feet and back onto the bed. I made all manner of sounds unbecoming a tough guy and settled onto my back. Mandy placed a hand on my chest and ran her eyes and hands all over my body, looking for the source of my pain. As it so happened, the pain seemed to come from everywhere at once. I told her, <laughs> I guess I fell off the bed sometime in the middle of the night. Haven't done that since I was about nine years old. I knew somewhere in my mind that it was a lie, but I kept silent in regard to the veracity of that statement. Damn, hon, it looks like you cracked yourself a good one, she said, gingerly touching my left temple, which came to life with agony as she barely brushed her finger on the sensitive area. Her finger came away from my head with a coating of flaky, dried maroon blood. My eyes went to hers, which were staring at the dried blood on her fingers. She should have been freaking out, as Mandy hates the sight of blood. I expected her to look queasy and unsettled, but the look on her face was one of calm serenity, almost the way someone looks at something they desire. Mandy? Oi! Mandy Pandy! Mandy Pandy was a nickname referencing the cute panda bear tattoo on her right buttock. She visibly shook herself, looked into my eyes, and then looked at her hand again, and then produced the expected reaction, running to the bathroom to wash her hand, muttering, ooh, 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 the whole way. I chuckled a little at that, which was a mistake, as pain shot from my temple to my toes with the effort. Now that Mandy had left my bedside, I could see the wall. There was no obvious damage, with the exception of an infinitesimal crack, about six feet in length, running parallel to the ground. I was interrupted by Mandy exclaiming something from the bathroom. I slowly, very slowly, got to my feet and trundled my way to the door. I knocked. Hey baby, you all right? I heard a sob from the other side of the door and decided I was well within my rights to enter. Mandy was sitting on the bathroom floor, crying. She pointed at the bottoms of her feet, which were dirty, as if she'd been outside, running through the mud. She'd started to clean off one foot, which had exposed scratches and cracked skin. I don't. <sighs> she began and devolved into sobs again. I carefully cleaned both of her feet, applying ointment and bandages to her cuts, and placed clean socks over the bandages. Against the protestations of my sore body, I picked her up and carried her back to the bed, placing her on top of the covers where she curled into the fetal position. I lay with her until I heard her breathing steady into the rhythms of sleep. I lifted the foot of the blanket to discover the sheets beneath it were soiled with dried mud. I walked out of the bedroom and closed the door silently behind me, made my way painfully down the stairs to the first floor, there were faint footprints roaming around the kitchen and living room, and I finally followed them to their origin, just inside the entrance to the patio in the backyard. I put on my sandals, opened the door, and stepped out, careful not to step in any of the muddy footprints on the deck, and followed further. The footprints led in a diagonal across the yard to the opposite corner from where the gate sat, untouched. I went through the gate and took a guess where the footprints would pick back up, judging from where there were large clods of dirt and grass atop the fence. I was off by a few feet, about twelve to be exact. Twelve feet from the last footprints to the fence. The incredulity of the whole situation was not lost to me, but I followed nonetheless. The footprints, more spaced out on this side of the fence, 
seemed to stretch off into the distance in the woods behind my house. I walked slowly, deliberately into the woods to see where they led, but was brought up short by the smell of death. I searched around for the source of the foul odor and found it, much to my chagrin, tucked into the bow of a tree branch. About fifteen feet above my head was the carcass of a deer. Its lifeless eyes stared off into the distance, at what was left of its entrails lay piled at the foot of the tree, a swarm of flies feasting on the leftovers. I was about to turn away and head back home when a glimmer caught my eye. I got as close as my gag reflex, which was considerable from my time in the medical field, would allow me to get. The glimmer, covered in what looked like the regurgitated, partially digested remains of the heart of the poor animal, was a necklace with a panda bear pendant attached. I took off my shirt and pulled it out of the gore, wrapping it carefully. I ran back to the house as quickly as my inadequate footwear would allow. I locked the patio door behind me and heard then the shower. I went back upstairs and saw Mandy had gotten up, shed all of her clothing inside out, and it was covered in faint red stains. I rushed to the bathroom and opened the door. Baby, you all right? I got no answer but heard frantic breathing and the sounds of scrubbing. I slowly looked inside the curtain to see she had scoured her skin raw, the water in the bottom of the tub tinged pink. I'd seen enough. I reached in and shut off the water. I helped Mandy get out and gently dried and dressed her. She let me do all of this without one word of complaint about pain. I kissed her forehead and led her to my car strapped her in, and drove her to the hospital where I worked. She was admitted to undergo a battery of tests, and I stayed with her as long as they would let me. I gave the attending, a guy I knew well, my cell phone number and asked him to call me if there were any results or changes. I drove home and started looking around the house for anything that might have caused her odd behavior. I stripped the bed and washed the sheets and the clothes she'd left on the floor, and I sat exhausted on her side of the bed. My eyes were drawn to the pill bottle from the night before. I read the name. It was a psyllin that I'd never seen before. Not amoxicillin or penicillin or any of the generics that I was familiar with. I grabbed my laptop and typed in the name of the drug. It came up with very little except that it was a new antibiotic that was supposed to still be waiting FDA approval. What the hell was Mandy doing with a prescription? I looked on the bottle again at the doctor's name and did a search. I came up with nothing. I called the hospital to speak with the attending, and he said he'd never heard of the drug either, and asked that I bring it with me in the morning when I came to visit Mandy. I did more searching. I found the name of the fairly small pharmaceutical company that was developing the drug, Ragnar Pharma. Looked like this was the only project they had going that had a public presence. I clicked on the About Us tab, and it took me to a biographical page, stating that Ragnar Pharma was a subsidiary of something called D-A-L-N-I. I was about to look into that when my phone rang. I looked at the clock. 2.47 a.m. I scrambled to answer. Hello? It was the charge nurse of the ward that Mandy was in for observation. She sounded terrified. Will, this is Judy at the hospital. She was whispering. Will, it's... it's Mandy. She's... <sighs> she broke off for a moment. I could hear her breathing into the phone. Judy, what the fuck is going on? What's wrong with Mandy? Judy came back on and said, Well, she killed a nurse and tore her throat out with her teeth and I, I think she's still in the building, but I'm not sure. My sleep-deprived brain was trying to process what she was saying and I pinched myself quite painfully to be sure I was awake. I was. The police are on their way, Will. I'm hoping they'll find her and nothing bad happens. No one's seen her over I'm, I'm sorry, Will. I gotta go. She 
she hung up with me still holding my phone and sitting there like an idiot. I put the laptop aside and was about to get dressed when I heard a muted crash from downstairs. The patio door. I grabbed the 9mm I kept in my bedside table and started toward my bedroom door when I heard a creak on the stairs. I froze, slowly raised my gun to cover the door. I watched, the hair standing on the nape of my neck as the door handle started turning. The handle reached its stop and the door started to open with agonizing slowness. A pale hand reached around the door. It was followed by an arm, shoulder, and finally, Mandy's face was visible, barely lit by my bedside lamp where she stood in the dark hallway. It was Mandy, but it wasn't my Mandy. This Mandy was different in so many ways, from her appearance to her mannerisms, but it was nearly her voice that she spoke with around the protruding canines. I'm scared. I did something bad. There were tears in her eyes, which were not the beautiful blue that I'd stared into and gotten lost in a thousand times. These eyes were black, predatory eyes, like those of a great white. My Mandy was nowhere to be seen in those eyes. She came further into the room and bristled at the gun pointed at her heart. I'd forgotten I'd been holding it and lowered my aim but I did not put the gun down. I held out a hand to her that she looked at curiously. Well, please help me. It sounded more like my Mandy, but I couldn't quite reconcile the coldness of the stare. She reached out and took my hand in hers. She dropped to her knees and embraced my legs, sobbing uncontrollably. I told her, We'll fix this, baby. We're going to be okay. Suddenly, Mandy was agitated. She began sniffing the air and a deep growl began in her throat. Her teeth were bared and I could see her fingernails grow in length before my eyes. Her voice was a hoarse whisper. I love you. I heard a soft <laughs> noise, a sharp prick at my neck, and everything went dark. I woke up in bed like nothing had happened. I was alone. My nose burnt with the scent of cleaning chemicals. I got up and searched the entire house. There were no signs of Mandy anywhere. Her car was gone, and calling her cell phone resulted in, well, nothing. It didn't even ring. I checked my laptop. It had been reset to factory settings. No one at the hospital seemed to know what I was talking about when I showed up asking questions. It seemed a few people had elected to take a leave of absence, or had quit, leaving no way to be contacted. I've kept quiet about this part of my life for the last five years, but even now I'm still angry, angry and heartbroken. I was reminded painfully the other day, when I was cleaning out my car, by the presence of a blue ring box from Tiffany's in the divider between the seats. I need your help. Help me discover what doll knee is D-A-L-N-I. It may help me find out what happened to Mandy. Thank you for listening. If you haven't already, don't forget to cast your vote for this contestant via either a thumbs up or thumbs down vote. New entries will be posted throughout July. Be sure to tune in and vote for each of them and help decide who becomes the next evil idol in the meantime turn off the lights and turn on the dark chilling tales for dark nights